Hello, today is March 15th, 2016, and I'm very happy to be joined in the studio today by Helga Tsepla-Rouche, who we've been hearing from recently on the website with a brief report about her visit to India and participation in the Ricina Dialogue, and I'm very glad that Helga has taken the time today to speak to us in more detail about this. So welcome. Thank you. So for the past few decades, you've been a leading advocate with your husband, Lyndon LaRouche, for the development of a Silk Road orientation for the world. You've made many trips to China in the 90s and more recently, where you're known there as the Silk Road Lady for your work over the decades on this project. And recently, there was a major turning point in this in 2013 with President Xi Jinping's official announcement of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road as Chinese policy, a breakthrough that was solidified with the BRICS meeting in Fortaleza, Brazil in 2014. On March 1st through 3rd, Helga was a featured participant at the Ricina Dialogue held in New Delhi, hosted by the Indian Ministry of External Affairs and the Observer Research Foundation. It was the inaugural meeting of a conference that's meant to be a real flagship for discussion from India. There were over 600 guests from over 100 nations, and the discussion focused on political, economic, cooperation and connectivity in the region and through international partnerships. Other speakers were very high level, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, India, several former presidents, including Karzai of Afghanistan, other Indian ministers, the former Chinese foreign minister spoke, the senior vice president of the Silk Road Fund. This is a very high level conference. And I know that for your presentation there, you would discuss the role of the Silk Road in changing the dynamic in the Middle East. Could you give us a sense what Tell us more about this conference. What is its importance? What's the, the context for this? Well, I think what it reflects very clearly is the fact that India, um, which obviously has always been a great nation and you know, is one of the greatest of human civilization with an uninterrupted history of more than 5,000 years, you know, it has an incredible richness of culture. So it's obviously a very important nation of the world. But more recently, it is uh, becoming, you know, it's the fastest growing economy of the world. It has even bypassed China in terms mm. of growth rates. It soon will have more people than China. Uh, it has the big advantage of having <clears throat> a very young population. Uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister Modi pointed out to the fact that 65% uh, of all Indians are below the age of 35 which is, you know, if you think in terms of productivity and labor power, it's a tremendous asset, not only for India, for, for the, but for the whole world. And I think that India is now having such an annual uh, conference, bringing together uh, important you know, politicians, economists, scientists from many countries, but especially naturally from South Asia and, and Asia, reflects the fact that India has uh, very clearly uh, a new self-identity as a coming world player. Uh, it is already obviously a world power, but I think you know, for many, dec many centuries, if not millennia, uh, the geographical position of India being you know, sort of south of the Himalaya, and really only having the Pacific and, you know, on the, as neighbors <clears throat> after the partition, Bangladesh on the one side and Pakistan on the other side, but otherwise being pretty much contained mm. as a subcontinent, I think that is changing now. Uh, and I think the, this conference reflects a new self-confidence uh, of the present Indian government in particular, uh, that India will take uh, greater leadership role in, in the future. And I think that this conference sort of was the starting uh, shot for, for that. How unified is the Indian political establishment on this front? Uh, for example, when you came back from the trip, you'd remarked on the difference between China, which is able to very clearly direct a policy and maintain it over years, and some of the infighting or other difficulties that India faces. How committed overall is India to this Silk Road or BRICS orientation? Are there other factors at play as well? 
Well, I think that on the level of Prime Minister Modi, uh, he clearly has, you know, started his uh, his term with the announcement that the BRICS countries are the first alliance in history, which is not defined by its present capacity, but by its future potential. And I think that still remains absolutely <clears throat> the outlook. However, I must also say that, you know, it was clearly represented at this conference that India also wants to be open to everybody, um, you know, because they did not focus entirely on the BRICS, but there is also a very strong influence uh, by <clears throat> the United States and to a lesser degree by Europe. I think Europe has sort of outplayed itself with the recent developments. But <clears throat> there isn't clearly an effort to also pull India away, especially from the collaboration with China, uh, and pull it more into security alliances together with Australia, Japan, the United States. And I think that is not decided right now. I think it's an it's open question uh, where India <coughs> will finally go, but that not only obviously depends on inner Indian developments. Could you tell us more about what you did at the conference, about what the thoughts that you presented in your presentation and your interventions there? Well, I was really torn what I should present, you know, because obviously, <clears throat> obviously, since my subject was Asian connectivity, um, and, you know, I first was inclined to speak about, you know, the, the whole question of the Silk Road for, you know, <clears throat> the relationship uh, of Eurasia and, and beyond. But then because of the urgency of the refugee crisis uh, in, in Europe, I decided to focus my, since I had only a short time, obviously, uh, to focus on the need uh, that India should play a role together with Russia and China in the development of Southwest Asia. And, you know, there was previously uh, an offer by Russia and <coughs> China approaching India that India should be sort of the mediator for the development uh, of the Middle East or Southwest Asia, because India has a very positive relation to all the countries in the region. So I presented uh, basically uh, the plan, which is part of our World Land Bridge uh, report, which we have been working on since several years, uh, <coughs> that you know the only way how you stop the refugee tragedy, which is right now detonating all of Europe, uh, is by having a comprehensive development plan whereby, you know, you take the whole region from Afghanistan to, uh, to the Mediterranean, from Pakistan, uh, from, from the uh, Gulf uh, to, the <clears throat> to the Caucasus, to Central Asia, and take this region as a whole. Because if you're talking about infrastructure, uh, development. You cannot just say we reconstruct Syria and we reconstruct Iraq, but you know, especially after the Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping was in Iran, and there he put the question of the Silk Road on the table, or the One Belt One Road, as the Chinese uh, call this uh, also, and uh, you know, basically said that the new Silk Road is. Uh, an option for a peace plan for the entire Middle East. And just uh, three weeks ago or so, the first Silk Road, Silk Road train arrived from Yiwu in China, uh, in Tehran, uh, and there were actually <clears throat> several people at the conference, including the former president of Afghanistan, Karzai, who said that he wished that that particular railroad would be extended to the whole region. And mm -hmm. that was obviously, is obviously part of what I presented. So, you know, I think it was important uh, of the many subjects I could have brought in to focus on that because right now the issue of the refugees is really, you know, it's, it's really a defining issue for the Middle East, for the peace to hold, uh, because the peace, in my view, can only hold if there is a real development perspective so that all the people, you know, who are now running away from hunger and, and war, that they have a perspective of hope. And that is also the only way how the refugees will favor to stay in their home 
rather than taking the ordeal of risking their life going over the Mediterranean in boats and uh, you know, then ending up at a barbed wire <coughs> between Greece and Macedonia, which is the total moral crisis of the EU right now. And that was, by the way, also one breakfast panel at the conference where people recognized that the present EU is completely bankrupt because they couldn't handle this refugee crisis, among other things. So that was my main contribution, uh, but I obviously participated in many of the other panels and discussions. Over the years, you've made a number of trips to India, including with Lyndon LaRouche, uh, meeting with Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, having a close association with her. I, recently, you were there in 2001, where you met with the president, and uh, again after that. Could you tell us about the history of the work that you've been doing over this period of time to have this outlook come into being and the success that you think it's been meeting with? Well, you know, I had the real great privilege uh, to have had several meetings with Indira Gandhi. Uh, and we worked with her on a 40-year development plan for India, starting in 79. And at that time, the urban, develop, the urban developed uh, people were 50 million. Uh, mm. That has now increased to about 430 million of people who are on an education level of Europe or the United States. Uh, and in 1979, uh, the idea was to have a 40-year development plan whereby the first generation, you would have infrastructure throughout the whole country because there are many parts of where, especially many parts of India, where you only had dirt roads, no infrastructure. And to combine that with a universal education for all children. And Indira Gandhi started to work on that program. And when she was assassinated, uh, we continued this work with her son, Rajiv Gandhi. And, you know, in a certain sense, you know, I mean, India has come a very long way uh, in terms of development uh, since that time, which is reflected by the fact that India does have now a significant economic growth. But, you know, there are certain aspects which <clears throat> I think were also highlighted by some of the speakers that, you know, for example, during the time of the Cold War, uh, you know, which is also, you know, when we met Ms. Mrs. Gandhi and, you know, obviously her father, Nawalero, had a very significant role in the non-aligned movement, uh, <clears throat> the founder of the Seychelles, Sir James Mansion, uh, in his speech at the conference, uh, pointed to the fact that, you know, the Indian Ocean uh, uh, was, uh, in the time of the Soviet Union, uh, <clears throat> India was very much concerned that the Indian Ocean would be an area of, of peace and, and neutrality. And, you know, in a certain sense, that is now being contested because now this geopolitical fighting who controls the Indian Ocean is, is a much more uh, <clears throat> disturbing question. But, you know, I think that India, you know, is really one of the defining countries of the coming period of mankind. When Narendra Modi came in as president, he spoke of the need for a mass movement of development in India. How do you see that coming along? Well, I think, you know, while there is no question that, that Prime Minister Modi is still extremely popular, uh, there are some people who, who say that he's even more popular than Nehru was or than Indira Gandhi was. I cannot fully judge that. It is very clear that he is a very, uh, very important leader. The people like him. Um, <coughs> but... I think his effort to fully go in the direction of this mass movement for development has met some roadblocks. Um, <clears throat> one being, you know, India has a terrible drought right now, which affects, uh, I think, more than half of all the uh, regions, which is very significant. And if um, the monsoon is not uh, coming through this year, it could really be a, a catastrophe. But I think the, the biggest problem is the party system. You know, I, I think you mentioned that when, when I pointed to the difference with China, because China 
in one sense has a one party system which in my view is much more confucian oriented than you would think communist uh, and it's a meritocracy it's a it's a system where if the government defines something to be in the common good then you know people are just building it and that's why china has been able to realize all of all of these projects with such a breathtaking speed now in india you have the two party system the BJ bgp and the congress party and that sometimes is a real uh, obstacle you know because rather than saying you know we need to develop the country together as a national unity project you know I mean, you have the problem that the Indian uh, agriculture is very, uh, not very productive. It has about half of the productivity of other countries in the region, like China, Korea. And, you know, uh, obviously, there must be a program to, to take infrastructure and agriculture as part of the same package, because you have to convince about 150 million farmers to not be farmers anymore and make the remaining ones more productive but that would require a comprehensive program of energy of you know communication right, right. of in-depth development education for the children of the farmers who still are called to work on the field sometimes by their parents just because of poverty so i think you know what is needed right now uh, would be really that you know I think Modi has the best intentions, but in terms of realizing the economic miracle which China has uh, clearly successfully uh, done, I think there are certain uh, obstacles which must be overcome, which I think would be possible to overcome. But I think a slightly different approach uh, I, would, I would take. When you present these concepts, they sound so appealing and so sensible for development, for eliminating poverty, for cooperation in this way, that the question arises, well, why hasn't this happened to a greater rate? Why hasn't this happened already? Why is there opposition to it? You know, you had mentioned, I believe, at the conference, there was some discussion about the U.S.-Indian alliance in a military fashion against China, for example. The U.S. has a pivot to Asia policy under Obama, where the Navy and the military is increasingly being deployed to that region. Uh, calling China a militarist nation, militarizing the South China Sea. And recently we've seen in Brazil with the detention and questioning of former President Lula and the threats against President Dilma Rousseff, attempts to overthrow the Zuma government in South Africa. It's clear that the BRICS is not, is not a concept being welcomed by everyone around the world. Who wants to stop this kind of development and why? Well, you know, I think it's still the old project of a <clears throat> new American central doctrine coming from the neocons, which, which have said, the Wolf Wolfowitz doctrine, that there should be not a nation or a group of nations ever coming close to the power, both economically and militarily, uh, of the United States. And the BRICS countries clearly represent an alternative model uh, because they want to base their relations on respect for sovereignty, on win-win uh, cooperation. And, you know, they have started to create a whole alternative banking system with the AIIB, the New Development Bank, the New Silk Road Fund, the Maritime Silk Road Fund, and so forth. <clears throat> and, you know, there are some people who, who want to, you know, ch change that and not allow that to progress. I mean, the South African government, for example, they have accused the United States of pursuing a policy of regime change against South Africa, which I find really incredible. You know, there are big efforts, as you say, to, to destabilize Brazil. But I think it's, it's sort of short-sighted because, you know, it is very much, it would be very much in the self-interest of the United States and Europe to cooperate with these nations given the fact that the transatlantic financial system could blow out every minute and, you know, especially after the European Central Bank went to a zero interest rate policy and even now is talking about uh, not to exclude helicopter money, meaning to throw as much money out as, as needed. You know, 
I mean, the, the, the transatlantic system is, is bankrupt and their self-interest would be to work on such, you know, projects like, you know, we have published this, this uh, 370 page study, uh, the new Silk Road becomes the world land bridge, which we have also now translated already into Chinese. It will be presented this week in a big way in one Arab country, which I'm not yet privileged to reveal. Uh, in its Arabic translation, it's being translated into Korean, maybe other languages. And it's really a blueprint of the whole world, how we go back to a policy of Franklin D. Roosevelt, you know, shut down the casino economy, go back to a credit system, and then, you know, reconstruct the world, not only the Middle East, but Africa. The United States needs urgently an infrastructure program. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and so, you know, in a certain sense, it, it's stupid to, to, to try to, I think mankind has come to a point where either we go to a new paradigm where we stop geopolitics. Geopolitics is really the poison which has caused two world wars in the last century. And, you know, there are obviously efforts which were also visible at this conference. You know, there were speakers, for example, you know, who would say, yeah, in Pakistan, Pakistan is uh, condoning or actually conducting state terrorism. Now, if you want to get an Indian upset, all you have to do is talk about Pakistan. Uh, and uh, however, Prime Minister Modi just went in, in December last year, uh, he went to Islamabad and he met with the uh, <coughs> Pakistani leadership and tried to mend fences. And, you know, so I don't think it's on every level, but, you know, I mean, obviously, there are people who play up border conflicts with China, who play up all kinds of geopolitical, you know, conflicts from the past. And, you know, I think, however, you know, there were several leaders, including Karzai of Afghanistan, Mrs. Kura Matunga, the former president of Sri Lanka, who passionately said, mm. no, India and China should work together. Uh, the Chinese economic development should not be regarded as a threat, but, but as an opportunity. Karzai <coughs> was emphatic to say that, you know, Afghanistan wants to become a hub of transport and cooperation between Europe and Asia. He wants the prolongation of the Silk Road through Afghanistan. And also uh, Ms. Kura Matunga uh, was very emphatic to say Sri Lanka wants to be a bridge of development for all the neighbors because Sri Lanka has good relationships to everybody. Uh, and there were many other speakers who, who said it is in the fundamental uh, regional interest of all of these countries uh, to, to work together. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a very important moment and, you know, I can only uh, hope that our ideas will influence these discussions as they are clearly already are doing. Let me ask, among these nations, China and India in particular, with this new system being developed, these developments taking place, is there an openness among those nations for cooperation with, say, the United States and Europe? Oh, clearly. I mean, <coughs> look, for example, Xi Jinping has uh, offered to President Obama already at the APEC meeting in 2014 uh, that the United States and China should work together in a win-win cooperation, which unfortunately <coughs> President Obama has not yet uh, answered. Uh, but there is a vested interest in stability. I think, you know, China definitely uh, is not a militarist country. Even they, if you push them, you know, you will not get a capitulation, but you will get a strong reaction. In the same way, uh, you know, I mean, there are 3.5 million Indians living in the United States. Uh, they obviously have a very big interest that there should be a very good relation between the United States and, and India. And, you know, I think, you know, we have to, I can only reiterate it, we have to move away from the old thinking. The old thinking meaning, you know, that you have to 
that your neighbor has to, or your <coughs> opponent has to be, uh, you know, put to the ground so that you can rise. But you know that kind of thinking, you know, in the age of thermonuclear weapons, will mean the extinction of the human race. And <coughs> I think that the new paradigm is already visible. I think the cooperation for the common aims of mankind uh, to overcome hunger, to stop the idea of war as a means of conflict resolution in the age of thermonuclear weapons is a must if we want to exist. Uh, there are other areas, you know, cooperation for the development of fusion power, which would give mankind energy security, raw material security, uh, the joint work in space. I mean, there's so many fantastic areas where we can become truly human. So I think we must arouse the population to look for those options. Sometimes this almost sounds like news from another world. The, the human rights success in China of lifting hundreds of millions, several hundred million people out of poverty over the past few decades, or their amazing success with their space program and the moon, for example. What advice would you give to Americans, how can we become part of this? How, how will the U.S. fit in on this? How can we make that happen? Well, I mean, I think that most Americans have become too inward oriented, you know, too much fixated on small issues, on banal cultural entertainment, on the, there is no hope in the United States. Right now, the U.S. population is pretty desperate. And the fact that you have a heroin epidemic, a drug epidemic, the suicide rate has gone up to unbelievable proportions. Uh, you know, that is a dead end. And, you know, the United States economy is collapsing. Uh, you, if you look at things like Flint, Michigan, or you look at you know, the excesses of Wall Street. I mean, there are so many things which are inherent to present American politics that I can only say you have to start looking at other nations, especially China. China has done an economic miracle in the last 30 years, which is breathtaking. Uh, there is no reason why the United States cannot go back to its true American uh, tradition, the tradition of Franklin D. Roosevelt, of John F. Kennedy and rebuild the United States as Franklin D. Roosevelt did. Uh, or look at India. India is a f equally fascinating country. If you would ask me which country is more interesting, China or India, coming from India right now, I'm, I'm really torn uh, because both nations, both are ancient cultures, 5,000 years old and longer as the new city which was discovered in the, under the sea nearby Mumbai recently, probably another 5,000 years to be added. These are cultures which have ancient philosophical traditions. In, in India, the Vedic writings, you had the classical period of the Gupta period, beautiful dramas were being written. You had the Indian Renaissance going from the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century with such great poets uh, like Tagore, Sri Aurobindo, and many others, uh, naturally Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and I think what is needed is that Americans should adopt any one of these countries, China, India, Persia, uh, Germany, you know, just other cultures and, and study what these cultures have to bring to the human family and what the future of the world should be when we exchange the great traditions of each nation. And I know that once you know these other cultures, you can't help but start to love them because they are rich. You know, God made the world not in a unilateral way, you know, just one country, one nation. God had a reason to do that because it's more beautiful this way. Uh, and I think that, you know, Americans should just really step back and think, how can we become like the American Revolution was? How can we think like Benjamin Franklin, like George Washington, like Alexander Hamilton, like John Quincy Adams, like Lincoln, like Roosevelt, like Kennedy? And I think that if people would remobilize that spirit of their own best tradition, 
they would have no problem to join hands with the other countries coming up, rising right now, and that is Asia. Uh, and that's the only way how we are going to maintain peace and how we as a human species will continue to exist. Sounds like we have a miracle to make. I believe in miracles as long as we do them ourselves. Understood. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, but I think I, I would encourage people really to start getting involved in these other cultures because, you know, right now you can see that you have a rise of chauvinism uh, both in the United States. I think it's very dangerous. You have people who are openly, you know, propagandizing racism, uh, uh, xenophobia. Uh, and the same thing, unfortunately, is happening in Europe as well as the recent election in Germany just demonstrated with uh, this so-called alternative for Germany rising. Uh, which is a danger, you know, this is what happened in the 30s where out of the combination of um, a depression, economic depression and currency crisis, you had the rise of Nazism and, you know, communism and this led then to the terror of the Second World War and, you know, there are many parallels to, to that today out of the depression and out of the <clears throat> monetary crisis, uh, there is a danger that right-wing movements will arise again. And, you know, this, if it would happen today, uh, for sure would end worse than the Second World War because of the existence of nuclear weapons. So I think that, you know, it's a, an important pe a period. People should not sit on the fence, but become active with us. Well, thank you very much, Helga, and thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and sign up for our daily email service to be up to date and have a clear idea about how to act in the time ahead of us.